Welcome to A Tale of Two Scribes. I'm your host, Eric P. Bishop. This is a podcast where interesting people come and tell about the stories they've crafted. As for myself, I'm an author. I've created novels, short stories, novellas, and even poetry. If you'd like to find out more about what I've done, please go to my website, ericpbishop.com. Thanks, and enjoy the journey. Welcome back to another episode of A Tale of Two Scribes. And tonight, I am pleased to be joined by Amy Levy. Hello, Amy. How are you? Amy! Other, other. <laughs> Why did I say Amy? For I some know. reason. Okay. Why is Amy? In, oh, do, I know. That's what it is. I know an Amy Levy. That's what it is. Ew. Every time. Oh, my goodness, Heather. I'm going to have him get that last that. name right. That is a, that's amazing. Uh, a lot of people don't get it that on the, the, the first try. So, yeah, you, you did Levy. He didn't do Levy. Well, you did Levy. So it's I, great. I should have just started there. <laughs> I was going to say, you know what? Let's redo this and edit, but screw it. This is like Joe Rogan without the millions. We'll just go <laughs> live. <laughs> well, Heather, thank you for coming on. So it's, it's great to be here. But if uh, um, if you ever meet Amy, she's a really nice person, actually. So I think she lives out in California, if I recall. I used to work with her. So, <clears throat> well, welcome, welcome. Yes. You have had an exciting year so far because your second book has just come out in February. That's right. Yeah. Hurt for me came out in February and yeah, it was selected for Amazon first read. So that yeah. was uh, exciting kind of seeing the numbers go. Boop. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been out and seems to be doing well. So I'm excited about it. How was, how was the, I want to talk about the process and talk about the books, of course, and I want to get into your background, but how was the process for the second book coming out versus the first? And I guess, especially maybe talking towards the fact of how Amazon selected that, how that kind of gets a lot more eyes on it, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, just coming from the indie world with my debut, Walking Through Needles, uh, to now being with, with Amazon, it, I mean, it was just night and day. Mm -hmm. Um I mean, you, as anyone who's worked in, in, in indie publishing, it's it's kind of a small outfit and yeah. you, you have a you do have like that really nice personal relationship with someone. So that's kind of the, the, the great side of the indie world. Um, but yeah, the you know, the marketing power and that kind of thing is it's right. it's very different. Yeah. Um, and then. You, you go with Amazon and uh, whenever we were looking, we were shopping the second, my second book, uh, you know, it's, it's a very, it's, it's a, it's a sexy book. So it's a sexy thriller. <laughs> and uh, when Amazon was like, Hey, we're, we're interested in it. I'm like, sold. <laughs> you know? oh. And cause we, we were looking around and, and we, we did consider my uh, first publisher. Um, but I felt like, uh, I was I was just ready to kind of expand, yeah. um, and and it's those are hard decisions to make as a writer because you have to kind of go with your gut and and hope that your gut is right. Yeah. And my gut was right. Uh, the you know being with my uh, my first publisher, um, and I'm I'm glad that that I I was with them. Uh, you know, my first book, even with it being an indie, I mean, I had my New York Times review, uh, yeah. which was amazing. My The LA Times, I mean, it had a really great trade review coverage. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I went with, with Amazon, uh, they just, they have a whole, they're, they're so organized. Yeah. <laughs> they, I mean, it's really kind of like a machine, but with mm -hmm. filled with amazing people and you have, you know, kind of a designated team for you with your, your acquiring editor, your developmental editor, your copy editor, uh, your um, marketing team. Mm -hmm. um, and they kind of walk you through these steps. And I, I will say like, it was, you know, kind of leisurely, with my debut, like the process of it, of, of getting the book out. And it's not like that with Amazon. <laughs> it's, I mean, it was it, like, yeah. okay, you have three weeks to get this done. And, or, <laughs> you know, like, like it was very, uh, it was very tight on, on deadlines. And um, although I knew uh, that, you know, they're like, if you, if you need to extend something out, if you like, they were, they were very nice about like, you know, Hey, if you need more time, you've, mm -hmm. you've got more time, right. but 
me being the type A personality that I am, I, if I have a deadline, uh, whether it's self-imposed or from someone else, then I'm going to meet that deadline. Right. Um, and I really try to, you know, even get it early, earlier on. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was very happy. I just uh, turned in my, the draft, uh, for my next book that comes out next year, this violent heart. And, and I was like a few days early. <laughs> <laughs> Which they were probably surprised. I was like, we have an author yeah. that has actually got there before the deadline. This is great. Ooh, it was a scary time though, because there, there was so much going on um, with promoting hurt for me at the same, that was the craziest thing. Gotcha. Writing a book while promoting and then uh, doing events for Mm -hmm. a book. Um, It was the most stressful time. Mm -hmm. And then it's also just a, it's just a busy uh, year also for like my daughter. She's with her graduating high school. She's Mm -hmm. got all these school events that are going on. So yeah, I work in the evening. I I write in the evening. So every time there'd be like a school event, it's like, well, there goes that writing time. <laughs> right. hundred percent. But it's worth it. You know, it's always worth it. Family always comes first. Always yeah. comes first. So same, yeah, it was, same it was way, just, same way on my end. My writing is 10 o'clock and later basically is most nights when I get to sit down. Sometimes if I don't, every other weekend, one of the kids, I'll have a Saturday and Sunday that I can, you know, delegate certain responsibilities or tasks that I've got to get done or writing blocks. But yeah, during the week, it's after 10, you got two hours and I have been very structured. I wasn't so structured when I first started writing, which was 2014. I just was like, I'd sit down to write and I would write until the, th- the thoughts were out of my head. That was sometimes one, two, three. I did, I think a four, four thirty time one time. And I was getting up then for, you know, for a nine to five job. So not something yeah. I highly advise <laughs> anyone doing. So when it came time to write in the second book, which in, that book surprisingly didn't get published and neither did the second book. But when I got to the second book, I was like, okay, I've got to treat this more business-like in a way of stru- yeah. and actually set up a plan of when am I going to write and then be really strict of, okay, when I hit my cutoff at night, that is my cutoff. Um, finish a thought, but don't finish a page or a chapter. Um, so that was a little, and so I kind of think that helped train myself where now I can go, okay, I got an hour. Okay. Make the most of that hour. Um, the yeah. hardest thing to keep it is put that in another room is what I've learned. Take your cell phone and keep it as far away from you and your yes. productivity will probably go up. <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm very much like that where I, I have to have, and I was not that way where, where I was really strict before, um, you know, being a parent, um, uh, with, you know, two kids and a full-time job. That's a very demanding job. Uh, Yeah. Like I, I had to make that, that window of time. So I had to sit down and and with my family, I'm like, okay, from uh, like, I get off work, I work out, I make Mm -hmm. dinner. And Mm -hmm. then my time is from seven to nine. My seven to nine window is whenever I'm writing. If I get, if, if, if we get done eating earlier, then I might, you know, have 6.30 to 9. Mm-hmm. Um, and I give myself some leeway, uh, you know, if I need to go over 9, because I am one of those people, like, I, I have to finish a chapter. Yeah. Um, I, or I have to finish a, a scene in the very least. Um, so if I'm not quite done, then, then yeah, I'm not going to stop in the middle of that, especially when things are flowing. You know how it is. Like, you've got to, yeah. when, when that tap is running, you can... You got to take advantage of it. That is true. Um, but, but yeah, now that I've kind of, you know, I have a, that very strict time whenever I'm drafting, uh, it's, it makes it so much easier so I can hit my, my goal, which is typically a thousand words okay. um, a night. Uh, so I can, you know, get a, depending on what, what kind of book I'm writing that, that may be a chapter that may be like half a chapter. Um, uh-huh. But, uh, and then the weekend, the weekend's like, oh, the golden time. You can spend as much time as you want, as long as there's not like a family thing going on. <laughs> so right. We do a lot of family things. So I, I'm like, I know I've got more time on the weekend. So, um, but yeah, you you have, you just say you have to when you're yeah. working or you have a family. I mean, even if you're single and you're, you're, if you're still have a daytime job, like it's, it's really easy to get into that. I'm just going to. I'm just going to watch some trash TV at night. <laughs> 100%. Uh, 
Well, even like I, I, I've read a lot of and seen a lot of interviews with some of the really successful authors, and they, tr- you know, they don't have to work a day job anymore. They've they've made it, quote yeah. unquote. Um, but they treat it like a job. I know some of them will like get up in the morning and they'll do their writing session in the morning, and then maybe they'll go work out or eat, you know, have their lunch or whatever, and then some of them get back at it in the afternoon. I know, you know, there's couple writers that will put a few books out. I guess nowadays it's much more common that you'll have one out a year. Um, but I know, especially like in the military ones, sometimes some guys have come out with two books in a year or they might have their own series. I know some of the guys that took over like Tom Clancy's books or Vince Flynn or something where they've kind of had their own book going and then they've had the legacy books. So um, I know one of the guys was writing. I know how people do that. <laughs> I don't know. They'd write one book in the morning uh, on theirs or, or whatever. And then the evening would be when they would write the other book. But I mean, you know, that's to me challenging because you've got different characters mm-hmm. you've got different plot going on probably different locations so kudos to anyone that can do that i've i've written multiple books at a time or multiple stories at a time but not well i don't think i, I think it's hard to kind of yeah i am from. not that way at all i, I get so immersed in mm-hmm. with the story with the characters um it's it's hard for me to say goodbye to them yeah. um like i still <laughs> It, it was, you know, now now that I'm uh, like in the headspace of the current book, and then I'm having to, you know, I've I've been doing things talking about hurt for me, like it, it feels weird. Almost feels like I'm cheating on my current characters, talking about <laughs> my these other characters that now, you know, I've written. They were a year ago that that I was right. writing. So, yeah. um, I mean, I still love them, um, and sometimes my characters have, have little cameos in, in other books. But that's awesome. Uh, but yeah, it, it's I get too I get too much into the story to try to write something else at the same time. Uh, yeah. I, I can't even listen to music while I'm writing. I don't okay. know how people do that. They're listening to music. I I listen to a lot of music uh, during the day that inspires kind of that kind of goes with my story, um, with, with whatever I'm working on. Uh, but as far as like listening while I'm writing, I get I'm I'm too. I get too involved with music. Mm. Um, anything that's creative, it it I I get too consumed and I can't focus on one or the other like I, I just have to keep them separate um hmm. but yeah so i'm just burning a candle and writing that's what i do <laughs> that's a good thing though i can do music that's my what, ritual <laughs> what i can't do is is have the tv on um i i actually had uh we're filming this on april 15th tax day yay, yay. Not really. um <laughs> but my deadline to get my book to my editor for my summer release was today now i've i got it in oh. yesterday but as I was going through the last like three chapters, I had the uh, TV on. I had the masters on actually, and so I kind of had TV on, and I'm going through the chapter, and I'm getting drawn in, and then I'm kind of like, "Oh, he missed the putt," and then I I just caught myself like starting to watch thing, and then I'd get back, wait, where was I? And I finally was like, "Dude, you got to turn off the television. You can't watch this because it was so distracting." Versus if I put music on, although I don't. I don't know that I've ever, I've written with music going, but I'm trying to think if I edit with music going. Not really. I'm not a good editor and I don't think I'm supposed to edit. That's why I hire someone, but I have to get, you know, I have to get the story yeah. to a good spot before I hand it off and pay the money that it's professional. Um, but I don't know. I have to focus so much. Not that I don't have to focus on writing, but the music doesn't distract me when I'm writing. It seems to just dis- anything out- outside of what I'm doing seems to distract me when I'm editing. And then I'm just you miss things that it's just like and of course you miss things that you've yeah. read, you've read 10 times. And you're like, I, I saw something the other day with, with what I was going to submit and it's going through it. And all of a sudden it got to the word uh, resident or something. I'm like, resident. What the? And I'm like. Oh, president. Oh, I, I left a pee off here. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. So I was like, how many? T- I oh, I didn't. I should have probably gone into my find and said, how many times is this there? And of course, I probably. Was president. Hopefully, the editor yeah. will catch that. That's what I'm paying him for. So, but. <laughs> See, I'm, that's one thing. I'm, re- I'm really glad I've got like the great editing team <laughs> at Amazon and they catch everything. They catch, yeah. <laughs> and, and even um, like, you know, things that sometimes we don't think of uh, as writers, uh, 
just uh, we we think we know like the timeline of things. Like, okay, yes, the because I write in dual timelines a lot. Okay. Um, actually, every book that I've written so far has been in a, in like a dual timeline. Wow. Uh, so I'm looking forward to the next book that I'm going to be working on, which I. I'm trying my hardest to write linear, linear, uh, okay. just to try to make it easier on myself. Even though, oddly enough, I find it it's it's very comforting for me to write in dual timelines. It just it feels very natural. Feels natural. Um, okay. So it it's gonna be it, it's actually gonna be work for me to write in one timeline and uh, one. POV. I might have two POVs. I think that that's that might be my trick to like. Okay, I'm like okay. I'll have the one timeline, but I've got to have two two POVs. So. There you go. Yeah, it's it's crazy. Have you ever gone the other thing too that? And I've not done it myself. I I, I write in third person, and I know people that have gone between different books and gone between first and third. And I've not tried. I will try that at some point just as a test. Um, which might be really silly on my part, but I need to do it as something I have to just be able to prove that I can do. But I, I don't know when I, I read first person all the time, but I'm always like, when I'm writing them, I'm just so used to doing third that I'm like, man, how would I do with first? So I don't know. Yeah. I, I, for, for me, I find whenever I've tried to write in first person, actually, um, with her, for me, I did, I was trying to write that book in first person. Okay. And, and and Ray, my, my character Ray, she ha she has such a strong personality, and she's she's got a strong voice, um, but it did not, it didn't feel, it just didn't feel natural for me to write okay. in, in first person for her for for whatever reason, and and I do I I've always written in third person, so maybe that was just me, you know, kind of interfering with with that process. I try to I try to you know listen to what the story is wanting. Um, if it feels like it, it needs to be in two, two, you know, dual timelines or ha have another uh, POV um, or like, you know, third person, like how close do I want to get with this, this character? Um, and it just, I, I felt like I could do more. I had more leeway in third person. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people feel like you, you, you have more freedom in first person right. and that I, that's the opposite for I'm me. Opposite, I, yeah. I just, I just don't feel that way. Hmm. Um, but if you've got a strong, you know, if, you, if you've got a person who has a really strong voice, great, go for it. Um, mm -hmm. But I, you know, I've read plenty of books where, you know, someone an author writes consistently in first person but you know eventually the characters start sounding the same so it's really right. hard you do yeah. have to like really work at it um so yeah that's that's kind of the thing i i, I feel like it's it's much easier to have those uh character traits that you want to put forward in in third person mm -hmm. um i agree and you can kind of i feel like you can go deeper too emotionally mm -hmm. um but that, but that's just me. I, I know, if ever, <laughs> you know, every writer they they have like their process, and um, and that's that's just been mine. I I, I don't know. I don't think I I will. I'll probably write like maybe a short story in first person. I've done mm -hmm. that. Um, but uh, as far as books go, it's it's just so like everyone writes in first person. It seems like now, it's um, common. Yeah, and especially in the thriller world. Um, and since I am not. Um, Cause I'm, I'm actually, I'm with, uh, Malt Lake with Amazon, which mm -hmm. is their romance imprint. Yeah. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. Um, which, which is, you know, I don't consider myself at all a romance writer. Um, so it's been, you know, interesting kind of getting to know people, other writers who are under that imprint. Uh, but they also, you know, they have a lot of people who are writing romance that, write suspense too or have thriller elements to them um and and certainly crime elements right. so uh yeah i that so that's that's kind of where i'm at i can't really talk about um what what's going to be happening forward or what may happen forward but uh i will say that <laughs> the, the next book that i'm writing is not a romance but um but it, you know i certainly i I'm very comfortable talking about sex and I'm very comfortable having those elements in my mm -hmm. writing. Right. Um, 
So yeah, whenever you're, you have a contract and, and they, and they're like, we, we want a, a, a dark romance. I can't say that I, I honestly gave a dark romance. I don't consider hurt for me a dark romance. Mm-hmm. And I, and I don't consider my next book a dark romance, mm-hmm. but it certainly has strong romance uh, qualities to it. Um, but it's, it's definitely more on a slow burn mystery for this next book. So, and then the, the one that's going to be coming down the pipeline, which is, um, going to, uh, involve the burlesque world. I'm really, I am, I am a lover of burlesque. Um, so that it's going to, it's going to involve the burlesque world and it's definitely going to be more, uh, fast paced kind of. Yeah. So, so I've got, I have like my, my debut, which was kind of like a, a slow burn mystery mm-hmm. and then hurt for me, very, you know, very much more on the thriller side. Um, right. this, this violent heart, slow burn mystery ro- romance. And then, yeah. So maybe that's just my, my MO. I'm just going to do like rural slow burn yeah. mystery, <laughs> urban thriller. <laughs> hey, as long as people are reading long as people are reading it as long as amazon or whoever is bringing you back the next year for another book what yeah whatever I mean, you so got they've, they've they're like okay we, you know we, we get dibs on the next one so i just have to That's keep awesome. making it so that they want to buy the next one 100 yeah so, they're pretty much like a book a year is kind yeah. of the goal so well, I know a few people that are writing with them as well. And what I've found that's interesting, at least in those authors' journey, is Amazon seems to, uh, you know, they're definitely cool with you doing um, uh, a series, but they seem to stop a lot of authors after three books and they want them to write a new three book series after that first three. So it's like, I, I can't say across the board, but I know like, I think three different authors that that's happened where they've gotten the book deals. And once they got to the third book, they're like, cool, great. You've done well, and they, they're successful books. Now start a new series with totally different characters. Um, and I don't know. Amazon's such the juggernaut of the industry that maybe they know something or maybe they've got data that says, hey, when you restart yeah. it, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I, at least I don't have to worry about that because I will probably likely never write a series. <laughs> I, it, and Weirdly enough, I had a lot of readers contact me and, and ask me like when the sequel is coming out or what, you know, that the, they thought that there was just going to, you know, the story was going to continue. Right. And I'm like, well, that's, that's lovely. I appreciate that. <laughs> that <laughs> Thank you. Want, you. <laughs> that you want to see more of these characters. Um, but I'm kind of a one and done, mm. uh, you know, I, I, I do like to have my endings be such that, okay, you have an idea of where the, where the, where the characters are going to be going. Um, but it's not super nice and tidy. Gotcha. Um, I'm not a real, you know, super nice and tidy ending person. Um, but the thing with, Mott Lake, um, with that imprint, uh, the first thing they, they asked was, is there a happily ever after? <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> kind of, sort of. <laughs> because romance readers want that happily ever after. Yeah. Um, whereas where the world that I came from, the crime fiction world, and I still always have crime in my books. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's kind of like this weird, like I have to have uh, that mindset of, well, I've got to, you know, do something for, for the romance readers. Right. Uh, but the people who have started with me, who are continuing to read my work, you know, they're also, they also have their expectations and then I have my own expectations and then trying sure. to find a way to blend those. Um, it, it, it can be a challenge, but ultimately I'm like, I'm going to follow where the story wants the story me goes, to yeah. go. And if it doesn't end up being exactly um, what they're looking for then you know it's unfortunate and um mm-hmm. but the great thing is that amazon has several imprints so that is true. you know that's kind of the thing yeah. um so yeah like i i i do know that i've got stories that are not going to be a fit with with Mont Lake. Mm-hmm. um but that's kind of kind of the beauty of being with a a, a large publisher that has you know many things under their umbrellas 100%, yeah. um so yeah we'll We'll see what's down the road. (laughs) 
Well, let's talk about the journey getting you to Montlake, like getting you to Amazon. So like we talked uh, off air before we came on is you actually have a master's in creative writing. Um, sure. And it's not anything I've explored with any anyone recently on the podcast. So uh, first question, I guess, would be is what pushed you in that direction? And then what was that? What was that process like for you to to go to school full time um, to be you know a writer in a way, really do creative writing? Yeah, well, um, the great thing is that I was in a low residency program. So okay. anyone out there who's ever heard of a low residency, if you don't know about a low residency program, it's uh, for you know working adults working, who yeah. do have full time jobs or fa- you know and families and whatnot. And, uh, so I would meet twice a year for, um, hmm. a 10 day residency. So 20 days okay. out of the year, uh, and it would be really intense, um, workshops. And then, and then the rest of the time I would be working one-on-one with my mentor, okay. um, to backtrack before I did that, I was really struggling with. Uh, writing long form. I had written, mm. you know, plenty of short fiction, had had published a, a lot of poetry. I kind of came from the poetry scene here in Oklahoma. Mm. And um and I was I was just not satisfied with that. I wanted to get a okay. novel out. And so I had tons of half finished novels. And uh, and then here I am, fast forward two kids uh, a, a divorce, remarry. And, you hit, and you I, hit all the high spots or the low yeah, spots. Yeah, I hit all <laughs> those, those, those spots. Um, and then I, I'm like, what, what am I doing? My, my dad had passed in 2013 and that was really kind of the catalyst to, you know, tell me, Hey, I, I needed, I need to do something with my writing. I need to do something to push myself forward. So I took a novel writing class and that's where I met uh, the guy who was teaching in the class, Mark Stewart, had uh, um, uh, referred me to Oklahoma City University's MFA program. Okay. It took me another year to even apply <laughs> to like work up the nerve. Right. Uh, and th- and the the reason why I did uh, apply was because I saw a reading uh, of the um, the professors who who were teaching the various authors who were teaching, hmm. which included Lou Bernie. Um, who lives here in Oklahoma with me? So Oklahoma actually, yeah, we actually used. To, we I didn't even know who he was, and here I was writing. We were writing at the same coffee shop, which is now closed. It closed during the pandemic, which I'm so bummed about. I I wrote three books at that place, um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I I applied, and it was it was a great experience. Um, some of my you know best writer friends I I made out of that program. And I mean, it was everywhere. The age range was from like 24 to uh, like in the 70s, I think mm-hmm. one of one of our you know, wow. writers. Um, so you, you really got just so much experience, so, so much, much uh, feedback yeah. and with from that diversity alone yeah. and then working with you know, amazing writers like Lou, Lou was my, my main mentor during the okay. two years. Um, but I also, you know, I, I worked with, uh, Allison Amen, who mm-hmm. is, uh, she kind of writes more on the, the lit fi- fiction side okay. of things. Um, I've worked with Carrie Cohen, who, were, who was a memoir writer, mm-hmm. uh, but, but yeah, just, just amazing writers, um, and and it was really Lou who kind of introduced me to the crime, mm-hmm. fic- the crime fiction community. It, he's like, you need to go to Bouchercon. So I went to Bouchercon, yep. and the first one I went to was at uh, New Orleans several years back, and have been to it every year since, except for the pandemic. <laughs> and uh, and yeah, that's just kind of where I developed uh, a lot of my friendships. Okay. So so yes, coming from. That's kind of one of the reasons why, you know, coming from the the crime fiction world and now writing a lot of elements with romance, like mm-hmm. I'm still like wanting to be, I'm wanting to straddle those worlds as yeah. much as possible because I don't want to let go of they my family. So, well, I think, yeah. I think so you can though. That's, that's the beauty of it is I, I, and I think as we get further along, the more the genre realms start really blending you know there, there's so much crossover i think between them so um it's it's funny you talk about lou i've got 
uh, November Rhodes down here somewhere. He's probably out of reach. He's in this shelf over here to my left. Um, but I actually met him up. I don't know if you know Jamie Mason. Um, yeah. I met oh, Jamie. Yeah. yeah so Her, Jamie lives up. Parties. <laughs> about she lives up in Asheville area. So I, I used to have an office in Hendersonville um, close to where Jamie was. So we met for lunch several times. But she was part of a writer's group. that I, That's where I met her. Um, and then she interviewed Lou one time at uh, Malprops uh, up in Asheville. And so I got to meet Lou. And then I've met Lou at some of the conferences. So, um, yeah, that, the community, the community side of this, that's the one thing I've tried to uh, encourage people with is because it's such a it's such a lonely road. I mean, you, you're writing, you're coming up with these creative ideas and you might be bouncing them off people. But ultimately, you have to put your rear down somewhere and write. And you're alone. Um, so to have that community of people encouraging you and um, especially someone, yeah, someone like Lou to have that as someone to mentor you, the wealth of knowledge that comes out of that is is really invaluable. Yeah, it it, it really was. And uh, and it gave me, it, I mean, he really kind of, he gave me that direction with with the, my writing because I, I had no idea what I was writing. Like I yeah. was just writing the story. Right. And, and he did always say, you know, it's like, just, um, you just don't, don't worry about what category someone's going to put your book in. Mm -hmm. Um, but he did, he did kind of, you know, say, well, ultimately you're, you're writing a crime novel here. Um, Lou would push you I, to crime, of course. Yeah, so. <laughs> of course he did. Of course he did. But I, I'm, I'm so glad that, that, that he did because I, I kind of had to have a, a crash course in, in writing or reading a lot of uh, crime mm -hmm. fiction, um, which I got during my, my, uh, time in the MFA program. In the program. I mean, I read that there were, you know, there were a ton of, uh, you know, books from my other mentors that, that I had, but Lou, mm -hmm. like he, he, you know, got me in on, on Megan Abbott and, yeah. uh, like, yeah, like I, I didn't, I, I ended up using, uh, dare me as part of my thesis. Mm -hmm. Cause I was, I was writing about the, the evolution of the femme fatale and <laughs> it, was, it was like the basis of my thesis. So, um, so yeah, uh, he, he, he really, he introduced me to, to a lot of amazing writers in that world who I later got to meet at, yeah. you know, conferences. And I'm like, this is crazy. Like I, I get to actually interact with these people. Like it was, it was something, something so new to me as a, as a writer, mm -hmm. um, to be able to have that, that kind of support and interaction. I mean, I had like support in the past within the, the poetry world, you know, people very much lift sure. each other up in that, but, um, but it's, you know, it's different, right. Writing novels is very different. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and the process to get published is very different from, from, from that, you know, from even short fiction, you know, difference, uh, a good word for that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know how it is. Like just the, just getting an agent, like yep. getting my MFA was one thing. Going through the process of getting an agent is a whole other thing, and that's one one of the things my experience that I got to take and go back um, uh, later on. I was teaching a workshop at at my mm -hmm. MFA program, mm -hmm. uh, and being able to discuss that with students because that is something that I. Like even the MFA program that I was in did not go over. Like, mm -hmm. okay, now you've written a book. What now? Like, yeah. you know, the the process of querying, all of those things uh, aren't necessarily covered in an MFA program. Right. You know, you're really focusing on craft. On the let's craft, make the yeah. best, the best, well, let's be honest, product, make mm -hmm. the best product possible. Um, which is weird, you know, you're a creative person, you don't want to think about what you're making as a product, like this is my baby. Yeah. Um, but it is. It is. And yeah. <laughs> and uh and and so yeah, being able to to discuss that with students uh who are now, you know, coming up uh, mm. and let them know some of those experiences and um to hopefully make it a little easier for them too. For them, because yeah. yeah, I had to learn the hard way and mm. it was the hard way. Yeah. So same um, <laughs> similar experience. My 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 experience started in 2014, and um, and I probably have said it on some of the other podcasts too. You know, I finished that first novel, and I thought, here here comes the easy street. You know, the dump truck's gonna get dumped into you know pull up into the driveway, and they're just gonna um uh, uh, 
George R. R. Martin said that one time in an interview where he uh, he, he was he'd being asked about fame and fortune or, you know, making it. And he said the the fortune, the wealth part. Wonderful. It's wonderful to have a dump truck of tr- of, of cash, you know, dumped in your driveway, m- metaphorically. Um, the fame part is horrible. You know, that's the part. It's like, you know, I don't want that. But but for some people or for probably a lot of people, you're not going to get either one. You're, if you get if you get. If you get one, you're getting the other, you know, you're not getting it. Yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, like, I think I, I look at, um, you know, uh, uh, Sean, Sean Cosby, S.A. Yeah. Cosby, uh, he, you know, we're, we're friends and, uh, and we've, we've talked about this, it, 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 like not that long ago, we were just, we, we kind of been talking back and forth about our, our books and, um, and what, we're, what we're working on. And we, we kind of came, we came up together mm-hmm. like right. i read the uh like the an early version of my darkest prayer okay. um he read an early version of of walking through needles and and i and i told him like you're like i you're gonna be famous he's like, ah. yeah <laughs> and then by like the next voucher he was he was talking about what was was gonna be razor blade tears yes. um because his his uh because uh black top wasteland was was already coming out and mm. or about to come out and and he was talking about this idea and i'm like oh my god okay yeah <laughs> i i'm like yeah. okay I, I i knew you win um but he <laughs> he has been so like he is the the nicest person um and even with all the success that he's had he's he's one of those people that i'm like he's always going to be the same like mm. i i don't i don't ever imagine him fundamentally changing and i think that's that is that is something that that's very difficult you know to to stay grounded if you do get to that point i imagine i imagine um right but like i like i i think about that like well what if i have this amazing hit like what would i do because i am such i am an extreme introvert Mm -hmm. um i know we all say that we're introverted (laughs) And then we magically become extroverted when we're out amongst other writers. That's right. kind of how it is. Like my husband's like, it's so weird. Yeah. Who and, is this and, person? <laughs> <laughs> because he's the extrovert in our really, you know, our relationship. But um, but but yeah, that that's kind of really how it is. And I and I think about man, it is so hard for, for like me to go and do events. Um, and it really wasn't until this until this current book and until it hurt for me where I actually started finally feeling a little bit more comfortable yeah, being comfortable. in front of people and talking yeah. about things. Um, I think you just, you do enough, you do enough podcasts, you do mm-hmm. enough um, in-person events uh, that it, it, it does get a little bit easier, but then I'm thinking, man, like, you know, people like Sean, they're traveling the world. It was just um, in Paris, like last week or the week before. He yeah. was everywhere. He was just in Norway. He was... <laughs> and then he like w- immediately went to the Hamptons. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like, how are you not? You've got to be so tired. Like, I don't even know how you're doing this. Like, what are you writing? <laughs> so... He's like, wait, writing? Oh. Hold on. Supposed to still do that? What in the world? <laughs> no, but trying to find the time with something like that with the success. But it's cool. And uh, Bobby Matthews, I talked to Bobby recently I had love on Bobby the podcast. Matthews. Yeah, was, we, we actually were hanging out not... I went to Bausher Khan two years ago. I didn't make it last year. I'm I'm on the fence if I'm going this year. I know I need to go, but just life, life happens. And it's like, okay, right. can I yeah. swing going there? I, it's a weekend. I have my kids and I'm like, well, I don't, I have a pretty hard and fast rule that nothing interferes with the kids, even writing, yeah. any travel, anything. It has, to, so it has to work around the schedule. I have the kids and I'm like, maybe I should just take the kids to Nashville. Cause it's like a five hour drive. So there's no excuse not to go. Um, it's like, well, what am I going to do with them? Stick them in the hotel, you know? And then I, so I'm still like debating and having this battle in my head of, do yeah. I sign up? Do I not? I still haven't registered. I think I actually about a week and a half ago, actually emailed the, uh, the, the address there it was on the website. It's like, is it too late for panels? And they, they sent it on to someone else and I haven't heard back. Cause I was like, well, if I if I'm gonna go, I want to be on a panel. I've been on panels before. It's like I don't yeah. want to go all the way there and just not be on a panel. So maybe that'll this be my answer if they get back. This with is me. the first year. I mean, because you know, financially too, it's like such a like. There's kids, one thing, yes, and then um, uh, and then it's you know, it's just it costs a lot of freaking money to go yeah. to all these conventions. Uh, this year, um, 
I don't know what craziness came over us, but because uh, my husband goes with me too. We, 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 I always have him traveling with me. I don't That's like awesome. traveling by myself for, for multiple reasons. I mean, one, anxiety. Two, um, I, I have a, I have RA, so I have a chronic health condition. So it's just sometimes I need someone there to like physically lean on, um, even, but, uh, but it's just I I feel better with him there, and he's so he's so great. Talk, he loves talking with writers. Loves it. Like, he's the extravert. Um, he's the one definitely yes. like. So he's, he's like, we gotta go. So he's Stop great. talking. He's great with it. Yeah. Um, but so I'm going to Thriller Fest, my first Thriller Fest. Okay. Uh, next month. Um, so it's and it's a from what I've heard a completely different crowd. Um, totally so I'm a, different. I'm a little bit nervous about that because I don't know, like, I know I have a lot of friends that I'm going to be seeing there that I've never met in person. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited about that, um, including some friends who are coming down from Canada. Okay. Um, uh, but, um, and then VoucherCon is kind of like my com my comfort food conference. Yeah, I <laughs> right, right? <laughs> but I've, I would love to go to Left Coast Crime. Um, it's in I Denver was next year. So jealous. Is it really? Go okay, to go. Well, then I have no excuse. So. I'm thinking of going because it's in Denver and I want to go to, I haven't been to Denver in a couple of years. So I'm thinking of going to there. I don't know if I have fit in there, but it's, I don't really write crime, but I'll kill some people in the next book. So we'll, we'll put that in the crime no. genre. I didn't know that they, they switched it up. I, um, I didn't know I'm that thinking, either. Yeah. I didn't know that they, okay. I, I don't know why for some reason I always thought it was in Seattle. <laughs> No, but, um, no, it goes the only actually. So the only conference I'm aware of, well, Killer Nashville is Killer Nashville. It's based on yeah. Nashville. I know some folks that went last year. Um, Thriller Fest is the only one that stays in New York. The rest of them, uh, the bigger ones, seem to move around. So, and I was going to tell you too. I've done Thriller Fest. That was the first three conferences. I went in seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. Yeah, two thousand seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. I went three years in a row. Um, great conference to go to. Um, once you've gone several times, I don't know that you need to go all the time. If the, if your publisher is paying for it, well, then go, of course. I mean, you know, oh, I wish they were, I wish they were. Exactly. But hey, tax no, no, no. I'm, but... <laughs> yeah, no, I'm saying if they are, if they're paying for it and I paid out of my pocket every time. And that's, that's part of why I didn't go back. Um, and then COVID kind of screwed every, everything up. Um, yeah. but, uh, it's so Thriller Fest is like the almost the granddaddy of the conferences in a way, I guess you could say. It's one of the it's been going on, I think, the longest or, or, or close to the longest. But it, it gets the most insider like agents and people from the publishing industry. It gets yeah. a really so it's not as many fans, but it's the most expensive. Like the, I think the first year I went, yes. I did the Monday through Sunday. I did the whole I did everything but the banquet. I didn't do the dinner thing because it was like two hundred and fifty dollars. I was like, for chicken or steak, yeah. I can I can go to the Palm a couple blocks away and have a fabulous meal for a hundred dollars. Why spend two fifty? It's like, well, you'll see fellow writers. I'll see them all week. It's okay, you know. Right? Are they giving right. me an award? I'm going to the cocktail hour. I'm good. So. <laughs> exactly. I could sneak yeah. in there and get free drinks. So, um, but yeah, the cost for that Monday through, and I actually that first year I went, um, I stayed at a hotel called the Jane, which was down in uh, Chelsea. So it was like a 20 minute commute just to get up and down there. But it Ooh. was like, it was re it was a coffin. You literally stayed in a coffin almost. I mean, you know, it was crazy. It, it was just so small. It felt like it. But that was the cheapest option versus spending double or triple the amount to be at the conference. So it was. We, we are at the conference hotel. Um, and I'm honestly not sure if it's going to be that much better than a coffin. So. <laughs> rooms are very small and very sad but um I, I don't know i i'm just excited to be there i mean it's yeah. just like walking distance to um you know the gardens and everything uh, this will only be my second time being in new york city oh, wow. like okay. being able to stay in new york city last year we took our daughter we went with our daughter as chaperones uh, for her school for mm -hmm. a um, she's a, she was a vocal major at okay. her, she goes to a performing arts high school. Mm -hmm. And, and so they were doing everything, going to Broadway, performing and, and doing all this stuff. And, uh, um, and it was just very, just breakneck pace mm -hmm. and it was raining the whole time, pretty much the whole time. Yeah, uh, we didn't get nice. to get, like, we saw the Statue of Liberty. We went to Ellis Island, which was, you know, that was cool and everything. Really cool. Um, we got to, to, um, uh, go to, uh, this, 
I think it's Stardust or whatever it is, the, the place where the, the, the people sing while they're, um, while they're serving you food. <laughs> it's on Broadway. I then we got to see Wicked. We got, you know, so we got to have all those experiences. It was great. Oh, it was amazing. Um, but, uh, you know, we couldn't drink. Well, we were there. my husband and I couldn't drink while we were there. So <laughs> we did, we snuck away. There was like a, like a, the smallest window of time right before we went to Wicked. And, and, uh, and we just kind of slipped away because some other parents were watching some of the students. And we went to the, this bar that was like literally right next door uh, to Wicked and just down. <laughs> Well, I will say at Thriller Fest, they will highly encourage you to drink. That when I when I went that first time in seventeen, the um, uh, the guy that taught our class, our master class, or whatever they called it that Tuesday, um, at the end of it, he brought us to an Irish pub, and we did what they call Irish car bombs. That was kind of our initiation for being done with it. And that was my first time having it. I must say, quite fabulous. But after three of them. Your night's over pretty much. So, you know, you, you've, you, you've consumed a lot of uh, liquid. I am a, to... <laughs> I'm a lightweight. I'm a lightweight. <laughs> I will say, uh, okay, so whenever I was last at Voucher Con, it was whenever my um, uh, book was nominated for an Anthony uh, yeah. for, for Best Debut. And and it was, it was an amazing night. But, like, people kept buying me uh, drinks. <laughs> So I was just like drinking way more than I would ever mm -hmm. normally drink. And somehow by, by towards the end of the night, my shoes were off. Uh, they were just dangling in my hand. And I uh, apparently like, well, I, I say, apparently I remember vaguely some of the conversation, but I was having a conversation with Dennis Leanne and just oh, goodness. with, with my shoes dangling, there's a picture of us. And was and this I'm in like, New Orleans? No, this was, this was in, uh, this was in, wait, Minneapolis, Minneapolis. Minneapolis yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It was, that. yeah, it was Minneapolis. Um, cause I didn't go to la I didn't go last year because we had too much stuff going on in our family. Like it, it was just like, okay. Um, I think I saw you in Minneapolis. I'm trying to remember because I know I was drinking with Bobby. And purple hair. <laughs> yeah, I think I I, we, I didn't meet you, but now that I think about it, I I I know I've I was like I've, I swear I've seen her before somewhere out book related. So that was actually the first yeah. Bowser County was the first. Uh, uh, Minneapolis was the first one I went to for Bashkan. Excuse me. Oh, um, but was, yeah, I, yeah, it was it was probably it was like my favorite one. Um, I, I love Dallas. Uh, when we went to Dallas, we it was on during Halloween, which that was a hard one because it was like, uh, couldn't be there with our our son because uh, yeah. he was you know still into Halloween. Um, uh, but we we like dressed up. It was like the end of Game of Thrones that year, so we dressed up as like I was Khaleesi and my husband was Jon Snow in like the worst wig possible. That's hilarious. <laughs> like going around with like a Starbucks cup. <laughs> I don't know if you remember like the whole thing, like that there was a Starbucks. That there was one in the background. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I remember that. <laughs> um, but but yeah, that was that was a lot of fun. But yeah, Mi Minneapolis. Uh, it was I don't know. I think it was just the vibe. Uh, the, I love the hotel. I, I felt like mm -hmm. it was easy to talk with people there. Yeah. You know, sometimes it, you kind of have it was that, a good that layout. compressed space. Yeah, it was right. a great layout. Um, the only, but, my complaint though is Minneapolis, everything closed so early. Like one night we went out trying to find something for dinner. We went to five different places and the kitchens were closed. So we ended up going to some diner. We had to get in the rental, uh, jump in the car and go to some diner a mile away. Cause it was like 1130 and we hadn't eaten and we wanted to eat something. So oh, we're at dang. this, yeah, we're at this diner. Did you, eating breakfast. Um, did you hit up Hell's Kitchen while you were there? Did not. No, that was, we, we hit it up. At least a couple times while we were there, it was yeah, hands down best food while we were there. We we had a, a great Italian food there too. I can't remember where exactly it was, but because that was one night where I was just yeah, we had we had a lot to drink in the bar before we even went. Before you went, yeah. <laughs> Then we had like a bottle while we were there. Like I can't, I have to recover whenever I get back from a conference because mm -hmm. my body is just like not used to the amount of alcohol. Um, but it's, it's one of those things. It's, it is a little, 
it, it's a little tricky. I can't imagine how it is um, not drinking. I'll have to ask Krista that because like, Krista Faust, like she doesn't drink. So doesn't drink. Okay. But she was having a great time. We had we had some fun conversations there. We, she had her little her Mads uh, um, doll. I don't know if you've seen it. Mm-hmm. Like her, when she would post her her little um, her little Mads Mickelson. Mi- can never say his name right. Mickelson doll and hmm. she like ties him up in bondage and stuff so <laughs> Goodness. but she brought him she brought she brought him <laughs> with, with her and uh do, doing all kinds of naughty things to him <laughs> taking pictures. So, so there's a picture of me like stepping on him with my you know my high heel oh no just... with your heel <laughs> yeah so the, the things that happen was, at conferences, I tell you. Yes. I actually, in, in Hurt For Me, I have my character, um, my, you know, because she's a, uh, later becomes a professional dominatrix. And as mm-hmm. she's like kind of doing cam girl work and uh, doing, she's like doing stuff with dolls where she's like doing bondage on dolls. And that, that was in honor of Krista. That, that, that she, she got her little cameo that she, uh, she indirectly. Got, cameo. Well, the, and the book, the book is actually dedicated to her. So yeah. in in part dedicated to her because she, she helped me out so much with, yeah. with, um, getting that book to where it needed to be. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, since she, she, you know, she'd worked as a professional dominatrix. So it's like, how many writers do you know who also worked as a professional dominatrix and you're working on a book about a professional yeah. dominatrix. So it's like, yeah, obviously I've got, I've got to talk with her about it. And mm-hmm. um, she, she gave me some invaluable uh, information and lessons. She was very hard on me. <laughs> so for, fu- like- for future books, all those little things can come out in future books, basically. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Too but fun. then hopefully I helped her out too. Like I re- re- she's uh, she just got done writing the last book and her Angel Dare series okay. um, called The Get Off. Um, I think it's it's coming out sometime next year, and whoo, it is amazing. Like mm. she's she's amazing. Uh, but her her character, um, she had, she there was her her character is going through something, and uh, and she so she was asking me questions related to that because because she didn't have. Uh, familiarity with it mm-hmm. so i was like okay i finally i get to help you out finally <laughs> something the um, community the yeah. community is always it's funny how the stories that people share and, and you come across people and th- that the most common thread i think you get from writers is how helpful other writers are which when i first started it years ago i just i didn't look at it as a competition but i assumed it must be you know because my goodness you know this is every you know I come from the business world. It's cutthroat at times. And, you know, if, if if you're making money, another business might not be making money. So I thought, well, it's going to be very competitive and you're not going to, you know, authors aren't going to want to give you their secret sauce. Um, 100% opposite of what I thought. Yeah. They're, they're willing to tell you exactly how the sausage is made. Um, and sometimes when you hear how the sausage is made, you realize, you know. Maybe I should have done something different. <laughs> Maybe I should have had a different. <laughs> really, that's how it works. But um, but it's great to have that insight, and especially for authors to share that with other authors and to you know kind of just help them and then just teach them the ropes. Because you know, like you said, you had to learn a lot on your own that you didn't learn through the program, and I was the same way. And then now I've found you know years into doing this that I'm able to get you know, people, authors will reach out to me and they'll say, well, what's the best way? I had someone recently ask about um, software. They were going down the path of, you know, publishing themselves. So like, well, what do you use for software? And I'm like, I didn't find it. Someone else told me about it. And I told them exactly what I used. I said, super simple. You buy the license. It's good for life. So whether you do one book or 50 books, it's going to be yours. Something that, you know, you just it's not intuitive to know that. So it really helps yeah. to have that, that insight as to what to do. So, yeah. Yeah. I've, I've definitely kind of, I, I come from, you know, that, that thought of, you know, lift up other people. I mean, yeah. uh, cause yeah, I, I did have that kind of view at one point as, as well, just, mm-hmm. well, I've got a, you know, you're hustling as writers. I mean, we're always right. hustling it, no matter where you're at in, in your, uh, your success, mm-hmm. uh, like you're always still hustling because you're yeah. only as good as your last book, right? That's what they book, always yeah. say. Um, so 
Uh, and, and like you said, if you don't have something coming out consistently, then, then it's really easy for people to, to not, not have you in mind um, right. to just forget your work. Um, Cause you know, readers, readers can be fickle. Um, mm-hmm. You do have those readers who stick with you. Um, but, but yeah, just being able to have that support of other writers and lift each other up mm-hmm. uh, when, as you said, it's, it's such a lonely process. Otherwise, yeah. uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know how, I honestly don't know how I would, I would have survived going through this last process of writing, drafting this book and promoting if I didn't or have friends who were going through the same thing or had gone through the same thing. And we were talking right. about it and working through it and kind of cheering each other on, like, you can do it, you can get through this. And, um, here, here we did, we, we got through it. Uh, you know, one, one of my, my good writer friends, she was like literally going through the same thing <laughs> and we had like the same deadline and we're both with Amazon. So it was just like, uh. um, but it, you know, just having that, just being able to have that to, to, um, go fall back on and, yeah. and know you're not alone in that process, uh, yeah, it just, it makes, it makes a huge difference and being able to, you know, <laughs> write the next book. Yeah. Um, Cause yeah, it's, it's hard. It is, it is really very hard. difficult. And it's like, you know, people say, well, what, why do it? If, if it stretches you out so much, I'm like, cause if you're, if, if you're doing it for the money, if you're doing it for anything other than the enjoyment and that you have to do it. You have to write. That is part of you and who you are. Um, then I, 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 I would say, absolutely, don't write. Don't be a writer, like, because right. you won't survive in yeah. this this world. Because um, I knew, like, if if I if I if I wouldn't have found an agent, if I wouldn't have, you know, found, been with a publisher in the traditional sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would have gotten my work out there otherwise, or I would have yeah. just, I just continue to write for myself. Mm-hmm. Um, it would have, it would have looked different. I wouldn't right. have been so structured for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, if, if you're, if it's in your blood, you just have to do it. It's the same thing if someone's a singer, or if they're an right. actor, whatever, all these creative people, like we're just kind of messed up people. We, <laughs> we, they're all we messed have up to do it. Yeah. We just put our messed up stuff down on paper. So other people, yeah, can we read put it. it down on paper. <laughs> and I mean, it's like, uh, you know, it's, it's a, I wouldn't say like an addiction necessarily, but you can kind of be addicted to that feeling of sure. when things are flowing. I think that all creatives have that moment of flow where, uh, you know, everything's coming to you so easily and you just have to type fast enough to get it out before it goes away. And, and I think that's how it is. I, I, I'm a singer as well. So like okay. I came from, from singing and, and yeah, like you have that, you have that time where it's like every note is hitting. It mm. just, it just comes to you. And yeah, I think if you didn't have that, um, <laughs> If if you didn't have that that flow, I don't know. I don't know if that. I'm not sure if that means like you're not that. This is not something that you should do. Like a person if they don't have that moment. Um, I mean, I think that you just have to work towards it. Because I know I have a lot of friends who are like, I want to write, and and they want to get into it. And they're like, How do you get into it? And like, you just write. You just write. Like you just yeah. write. And then yeah. you know if it if it come if it feels natural and it feels like you crave it mm-hmm. then then yeah okay maybe you can do something with it mm-hmm. but if you're not craving it if you don't have that urge that desire like i don't know i don't know how, how someone can have a career in it um, yeah if you don't and- enjoy it i don't think you can i mean i know there's always an exception to the rule but as a general rule i'd say no you can't it's got to be there's story for, for you know speaking as a writer there's stories in me that have to come out the day they aren't in there and won't come out, I think will probably be maybe it'd be a relief. I don't know, but I think it'll be a sad day. And I don't ever that my the first person I I had as an editor, they said, "Hey, what if I tell you the story's no good and it can't get published? Um, what will you do?" I said, "I'll write something better." 
Uh, they're like, okay, so you're not one and done. I was like, no, no, no. I will write stories the rest of my life. I don't know if they'll get published. I don't know if people will enjoy them. But at the end of the day, too, and I, I've said this to other people, of I don't write for them. If I read my story and at the end I go, damn it, you did it again. What a good story. Yeah. Mission accomplished. I I, I was telling you um, before, I just, you know, had a deadline for my 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 second book, my sophomore book. Um and I, the third and fourth to last chapters are very emotional. Um, I kill someone in a very epic fashion and it's someone that I know and I put them in the book and they knew they were going to be in the book. And every time I read that chapter, which I've probably been a dozen times in the last six months, I tear up just, and I, and I, mm-hmm. and I, I read it Sunday morning. It was a lot. And by the second to last time I'll read it, at least for now, uh, I'll read it one more time after it comes back from the editor. I'll, and that's literally just to make sure, okay, I'm cool with the editorial changes or uh, yes or no. And then that's it. Then I'm done moving on. Um, but man, that I got to those chapters again and I was just sitting there like oh, reading and going, okay, it's working. It worked. And I was so proud of the words that were in there and the, and, and I, I, I told what I wanted to tell, what I wanted to say came out. And it's just like, that's what I do it for. Um, yeah. Even like when the, when the first book came out in 2021, man, if I could have bottled that feeling and every now and then just take a little swig, I wouldn't need anything. Wouldn't need alcohol, wouldn't need food, but that's not life. So your next one comes out and it feels good, but it didn't feel as good as the first one. So your brain goes, write a third one. It'll get better again. And I don't know if it ever will again. But I'm always chasing that feeling. I'm always chasing that yeah. you did it again feeling. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's um, it. Yeah, just whenever just reading over the draft that I just got done writing and like kind of going over my agent's notes before it was was sent off to the publisher. Like I, I just kind of had to sit sit down and say, okay, how do I feel about this? Because it was mm-hmm. it's very it was a very different book for me, mm-hmm. and it was. And, very personal in a lot of ways. Um, this, this book I just finished and, and it felt like I, I felt a vulnerability that I hadn't felt with, Mm um, uh, my two prior books really like, like even walking through needles, which was a very dark, uh, book that does have a lot of elements that I can, that, you know, I have had experience with not the abuse elements, but like, um, uh, the character, you know, her, her sexuality, um, and, uh, with, you know, the, the current book, I was just going through it and, uh, and it just, it hit me. I'm like, yeah, this is something I'm proud of mm-hmm. and whatever category it's going to be put in. Cause I, I, I already know that there are going to be some readers who are absolutely, um, not get or reviewers, whatever, or, or they're, you know, they're going to look at it a certain way, sure. um, because, uh, just because of some of the themes that are in it. Cause there's, mm-hmm. you know, religious trauma, there's, you know, it's, sure. you know, I've got a character, a bisexual character who <laughs> is, you know, very guilt riddled and, um, mm-hmm. and not for, for on multiple sides uh, yeah. and just not accepting of, of who she is completely. Um, and so, yeah, so it, I, but just reading through it, I was like, okay, I feel uh, just the strong emotional connection. And, and then of course there's like, okay, the sex, obviously. <laughs> it's romance. Okay. Can you make things spicy in this next book? Cause apparently some writer right, uh, readers did not feel like hurt for me had enough spice in it. Didn't have it enough spice. <laughs> very steamy. So um, I, I'm like, I don't know what, what they want um uh, but plagiarize I mean, some 50 shades of gray i guess and just dump in a whole guys, bunch of <laughs> oh all the time when whenever people would even put put my book in the same category i'm like okay no offense to fit to that book but <laughs> i coming from the kink community because i am part of the kink community uh it's that book is like you know, <laughs> I know, big giant red X, right? <laughs> it, it has done so much damage for the community. Yeah. So, um, but but yeah, so this this book uh, is not like you know like kink heavy. I always have like kink positivity in in, in my book. So if I'm gonna have any kink, it's gonna definitely be positive, mm-hmm. uh, positively looked at. Um, but yeah, even whenever I, whenever I got to the sex scenes, I was like, it was the first time that I was like, damn, I'm really I'm really 
proud of these. these I'm really proud of the sex scenes I wrote. They were like, like my my agent was like, you write like beautiful sex scenes, (laughs) like, (laughs) like. Because I want it to emotionally connect. Yeah. I, I don't believe in having sex in a book just to have sex in a just book. Just for the gratuitous um, part of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not right. not in not into that. Um, I mean, there are plenty of books that, go, if, you, if you, you know, erotica, obviously. Mm-hmm. I love erotica. I read plenty of erotica. And and they're great. They're fun. But uh, they don't always have a, like, emo- you know, you're not really looking at the emotional connection between characters. So, right. yeah. So it was, it was, it was like that moment. I was like, okay, I did, I did what was asked of me, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but I did it in my own way. Yeah. And, and that's kind of where I'm always coming from as a writer. I'm like, what, you know, I, I, as long as I'm proud of what I'm doing and I want to read what I am writing, Mm -hmm. I am my first, you know, worst critic. And, um, so yeah, but but, then I'm like, okay, I, I feel comfortable putting this book out in the world because mm-hmm. there was a whenever I was first writing the book it was I was like I don't know I don't know I don't know about this yeah. I don't know how I feel about this this book and then by by the time I got to the end and and doing initial revisions I was like okay okay now mm-hmm. I've got my my character where I need her to be so yeah, you get more comfortable with it. Well, it's it's hard because once you get to that spot, and I guess I'm really there now, or I will be there in about a, two weeks with Breach of Trust, is once you get to a spot where you can no longer change it, it's out there, it's done, and there's no turning back. That's That bothered me 2021 when my first book came out, and it hasn't since. Ever since with the novella last year and then now with Breach of Trust, I'm like, you know what, I've I guess I'm just more comfortable now. It's not confidence. I think it's more just comfort level of I've told the story I want to tell. I could revise it the rest of my life, but what's that going to get me? That's going to get me no more stories. So at some point, you just have to say, okay, I've read it. I'm cool with it. Um, I I had – it was a story I had worked on for a while and publisher changed, publisher went out of business. And so I had this story that it's like, well, it's going to be hard to go shop this around um, because of what happened with the publisher. And then I'm starting fresh. It's like, well, I've put it out myself. Okay, cool. I want some other people to look at it. So I had some writers look at it. They were extremely kind. They thought it was better than my debut, which I was like, okay, I'm on the right path. But then Earlier this year, I wanted some writers, or I'm sorry, not writers, readers to actually just like run of the mill people that just enjoy that type of thing. So I got about 16 people and I said, okay, you got three weeks. If you if you don't get back to me in three weeks, I'm cool with that, but I'm not going to ask for it. I'm going to move on. I'm going to take the feedback I got. Um, They all got back with me and the feedback I got and they, you know, they found little tweaks of like, I don't know if the character would do this or I don't know if, you know, with that kind of clearance, you'd be able to do that. And I'm like, well, yeah, I'm just making stuff up. I don't actually have top secret clearance, but, um, but they were a couple of them were people in the know. So it was super helpful to get those little professional tweaks done, but overwhelming. Everyone's like, I can't wait to recommend it to people. And I'm like, okay, cool. I believe in it. But it is nice to get that confirmation from readers to say, hey, we believe in it. So, yeah, I will say that's one of the scariest things um, now with having such a short, you know, being on contract is very Mm -hmm. different for me. Uh, Walking three needles. It was just, you know, it was I I got to work forever on it. Yeah. Um, You get to work your whole life on your first novel, basically. And then Hurt for Me was written out of fear (laughs) that I would, would, one, lose my agent, which I know I wouldn't have. Like, she was going to hurt your career if you don't get it done. Yeah. I have an amazing agent, but she was very much like, Heather, you know, we really (laughs) need to get something out into the world. And and I wrote that book in two and a half months. Wow. I know that's insane. It, that will never happen again. Um, okay. But it just—you proved it, you can do it, flow. though. The flow was happening, yeah. and I, yeah. So I, I got that out. Um, but then with uh, the book that's coming out next year, it was the first book that I wrote that was on contract. So oh. I sold it on proposal, um, which was weird. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that was a, that was an interesting process. I'm like, okay, here are like first few pages and the synopsis, mm. and and now I'm like crap now i have to write it i actually have to write 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 it by this time and it was a short window of time that Mm. happened to be with all this other stuff that's going on with hurt for me Um, so so yeah it was like 
I don't have, I did, I didn't have time to have someone else read it. Um, I barely had time for people to read her for me. Um, yeah. uh, but, but, you know, like, so, like Sean read it, Krista, mm-hmm. there, like there were some writer friends who, who wrote it or who, who read it and, and were like, yeah. Um, but, uh, but with, with this violent heart, like it's kind of terrifying because literally no one has read it outside mm. of my agent before mm. it's going to the, the editor. Yeah. Um, oh, well, besides my husband, my husband, who was the best, most evil editor ever. And the most evil so, editor. Wow. Yes. He, he is a tough editor. He really is. He's a, he's a cool. big reader. So he's, he's very, he's blunt with, with, uh, with his suggestions, but, um, but, but yeah. So outside of, so, you know, it's like two, two people mm-hmm. it's off to the hands of my publisher. And it's kind of like, well, I, I, I do hope that they like it. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause that would, you know, suck if they didn't, it, it, <laughs> I, they already paid me. So, <laughs> but, That's too funny. but you know, they, like you, you only get paid half and then right. whenever you deliver. And then if there are major things that they want changed, if you don't deliver on that, then yeah, they you could if they don't accept the book, ultimately you don't get the other half of your money. So yep. and I've got a kid who's going to college this year, so I have to make got it to. amazing. And I've got to make the next book amazing. So it's right. yeah, so it's always that process of okay, now I really do have to be comfortable and confident in what I'm producing mm-hmm. because I do not have the luxury of having yeah. a ton of beta readers. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that is scary. That is a very yeah. scary process, but, but yeah, as you said, you kind of, you get to that place where, yeah, you kind of, you, you've developed your voice, you know, who right. you are as a writer. So yeah, I, I, I feel like I'm, I'm finally get I'm at that point where I, I feel very comfortable that I can produce something mm-hmm pretty damn decent in a short yeah. amount of time shorter amount of time than i would want you would want but, yeah. but at the same time hey i don't, don't mind getting paid every year for a book so 100 <laughs> percent, yeah especially the amount of authors that you know make so little or you know i, I know people that have gone with smaller publishers where they've had to, they've had to pay like they've had to pay for an editor or they've had to pay for the cover or all that and i'm just always like I what? mean, I'm at the point now with with having my own imprint, I'm having to pay for stuff, but I also can control the whole process where I get to choose how much I'm putting into it. And I can yeah. also see, I can see in real time on a daily basis, if my marketing's working, if I'm making, you know, right. if I'm in, and, and then if it's successful, I don't have to give away, you know, majority of the profits. So, you know, but it, it's, it's, it's yeah. interesting. It's, but, but yeah, people that I've met that have actually actually to pay for specific things and then they're still getting the minority of the money and they're still, you know, all these other things. And I'm just like, I think if you want to pay, maybe you should just do it yourself. Um, because if you're willing to invest money, there's a lot of great resources out there for you, but, um, with paying and yeah. then not having, giving up as much as you give up, I wouldn't do that personally, no. but again, no. Yeah, it's, but it's yeah. Ways to do it. I mean, and, and Amazon, they're like real, they they're they're really good to the authors because they, they pay monthly. Um, so yeah. you know you're getting royalties. Uh, it, once you've you're, you've paid back your advance and you're getting royalties monthly. So yeah, once once writers have um, a, you know, a few books under their belt with them, then uh, from what I've heard from my friends who have been with Amazon for for a few books, they they're like they just they've got that income stream mm-hmm. coming in yeah, uh, and you get to see those very detailed numbers, like yeah. even like where parts of the country where your book is selling the, the best and that hundred kind of percent. Like, yeah. Real, yeah. So I'm like, wow. Okay. That's, the, that's all information that I never had access to be, right. before. So it is. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a <sighs> publishing is just, it's a crazy world. It is a crazy world, but it's, and it's, then there's it's, so much that e- that we don't have access to as, yeah. as writers. Like e- even the best publishers, you like don't have access to. I know. Um, but it's amazing though because we get to get our stories out there. And, and you were talking, and we were talking earlier about it with with having you know your two kids. It's something you get to leave behind. It's it's a legacy, you know. Versus a lot of people, myself included, with my day job, there's nothing there 
to hand off to my kids one day. There's a paycheck and there's a way of providing for the kids and trips and the house and food and stuff that's essential to life that I'm very grateful for. But the books we write, um, that's something that we'll be able to give to our kids and our grandkids. We might have to rip out a few pages here and there and be like, don't uh grandma heather wrote this but you You can't read chapter seven you know until until you're 21 (laughs) so right right yeah but yeah absolutely i and i and i hope my both my kids are big readers and Mm -hmm. i hope that one day they'll you know they'll pick up my book and and go to the the library has your daughter read them no um okay i and i and i told her i'm I'm like i i feel like she I'm not sure how I would feel about her reading Walking Through Needles because it is is pretty dark, pretty, uh, you know, difficult book. But like the book that I just she 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 does like romance as well. And um, uh, being that we are, you know, she she came out as as, uh, bisexual and um, and I am I am also a bisexual. And so like both coming from like the queer community Mm -hmm. and the book being very much a queer romance mystery mm. so it's like it's kind of in her world I'm mm-hmm. like I feel like he would like this book mm-hmm. <laughs> very much because <laughs> there's nothing um I mean there is darkness in it because I just can't help it I do write a lot of dark elements in my books um but uh I think it, there's there's kind of more uh lightness to okay. to the book certainly out of out of my three books there's like the most lightness in the this most book. okay <laughs> and, and and then yeah and of course there, there's still like the moments where I'm like okay I, I would be cringing a little bit her reading it um mm-hmm. just because I, I would just tell her don't imagine me writing it just imagine somebody else somebody don't else think of your mom it, and then you would tell <laughs> then you're fine with it <laughs> that she'd be like, mom, because, you planted that idea in my head. I can never get it out now. You're like, oh. yeah, because I know the book. I know some of the books that she's reading. And I'm like, well, she's already reading books that, the yeah. how you know, characters are having sex. And yeah. um, so I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm part of me is also curious, like how in, in her mind, how my book would stand up, because this is the first book where like I've had queer characters in my books. Um, but I've, uh, this is the first book where I wrote on the page, um, queer sex, which mm. is also a very different thing too, with the romance world, because you have, you know, there's a lot of male, female scenes. Um, right. and that's kind of a, a, an expectation that people have. Mm-hmm. So this is a little bit me, um, I don't know, I wouldn't say subverting that expectation, mm. but hopefully, having the same care put into that uh to those scenes as as i do in my male female scenes yeah but then again uh well i don't want to go too much into the the story but (laughs) let's just say my care my character's uh confused and she she makes some very poor decisions that involve two people that she oh no yeah (laughs) and and, uh, um but uh but yeah, people I, just I have like to buy my, the book to read it to find out. You'll what you're have to buy to, the book you know? to read it. Just just a, a brief synopsis on it. It's about a, a young therapist who reluctantly returns to her rural hometown, okay. where she discovers some uh, uh, troubling things surrounding some some. Uh, she discovers just kind of like some, I don't want to say evidence, but some troubling things surrounding her uh, teenage best friend's mm. death which may not have been by suicide okay um all while grappling with her bisexuality and uh reconnecting with her her best friend's twin brother mm. so yeah. <laughs> so it's, yeah so it's it's very it, it centers around a lot of guilt um yeah. and and religious trauma and kind of uh, you know, kind of rec- reconciling some of those things. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I, f- I feel like my daughter would totally, she, she would living in Oklahoma be <laughs> being queer. Like there's, there's always an element of religious trauma. L- luckily, I, I don't know if I say luckily, but uh, she, the, both her, her dad um, and, and our, our family, we, uh, uh, 
we were not like religious like Mm -hmm. now, but I grew up very much like in a very conservative household. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I did go to Sunday school (laughs) on the little bus, the little bus (laughs) to get my popsicle and my fruit punch. And (laughs) so, yeah, so I had a lot of those things drilled into my mind Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and I, it, I think it's so great. Um, I was telling her this other day. I'm like, I, I think it's wonderful. Like her generation, they don't have that as much hanging over their heads. Mm-hmm. Um, or at least, she, you know, not here. We, we live in this kind of very uh, open bubble in Oklahoma City. So yeah. um, we have a very uh, like big welcoming community here okay. um, that is progressive. Mm-hmm. Um but obviously it's not like that. And, and, you know, much of, much of the state. Right. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's important for me to write characters mm-hmm. that are having those lived experiences. It was funny with hurt for me. I had some readers who were like, uh, had commented on, you know, the book was too woke and that these things don't happen. And I'm mm. like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> like obviously they don't live here but, i was but gonna say yeah I'm like, I'm like yeah these things do happen here unfortunately you know that th- that is definitely something um you know a lot of people face so yeah that's they were like why do you write about some of these things i'm like because it's it, it needs to be written about right and there are a lot of people who are doing and like way better job than i am at it mm-hmm. um who have been open in the community for a lot longer than I have. And, uh, and I, I, I'm like, you know, we have to, people have to keep writing these characters, whether mm-hmm. it's uh, queer representation or, um, you know, uh, any marginalized community. Mm-hmm. Like we just, we, it has, they, it has to be done because yeah, there's already a small percentage that get published. And I'm well, just, I'm, ma- I'm, I'm, I'm proud that Amazon mm-hmm. looked at that story and they said, yeah, we're going to give right. you money and we haven't even read the book yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm like, that's t- to me, that tells me that there's a little bit of it. There's a shift happening. I hope yeah. anyway. Yeah. hundred percent. Well, you get the, the, the cool thing about all of it is you get to tell your story and people, you know, it's so easy. And I mean, the, our country is so diverse, but it's so easy for people to just be in their little bubble and what they feel. I mean, I grew up very conservative. So, you know, h- how you grow up, sometimes you project that and go, well, that's how everyone should believe. Yeah. No, as I've gotten older, I realized, man, there's so many people out there that have so many different opinions. And whether I agree with their opinion or not, it's irrelevant. They get to make their choices. They get to live their life as, as they should. They should be able to do that. It's not fair for me to tell them, hey, guess what? You need to do whatever's in my head. It's like, no, that is the ultimate in control. Um, So, yeah, the the fact that your stories, your words, you get to put your voice out there. You get to put your thoughts on there. Um, And, again, it's it's such a powerful thing. Um, No matter which direction you go with it, just the power that are in those written words and that people, especially if you do go into diverse lifestyles or voices someone reads that that is part of that community that that connects with them and yeah. that might that might be the thing that gives them hope and that to me is kind of the coolest thing we get to do as writers is we get to take these stories and we get to put little nuggets of things in there that you might not pick it up on it but someone else might pick up on it and that might be something that really cuz it's just the feedback i've gotten the last couple of years from people that have picked up certain things it's been all over the board and some things that I thought people would pick up on and be like, Oh, I loved how you said this might have rarely been mentioned. And I'm like, man, I thought that that was the one that was connect. No, it was something else that I didn't expect that a bunch of people said, man, I really love that you did this with this character. And I was just like, man, I think it was unintentional, but awesome. I'm glad that connected with those people. That's yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. that I, I totally agree. Um, I mean, yeah, that's, that's really, that's a, the biggest thing as a writer is just being able to have that moment with a reader. Uh, and every time I get a message from, from a, a reader, whether it's a, you know, DM on Instagram or whatnot, like, it's like, 
Like this isn't, I, I, I write for me first, but getting that feedback from a, a reader and knowing that it connected to them on a, on a deeper level than, than mm-hmm. even maybe I anticipated uh, that just makes me want to do even more and, and write the best damn book that I can. So that, that reader will, you yep. know, read the next book and the next book and, um, and hopefully always connect with, with the, the characters. Um, because I mean, we, you know, we put a little bit of ourselves in the characters, no matter what, whatever the mm-hmm. character is going through could be vastly different from anything that we've ever been through ourselves. But there's that little bit, yeah. there's that question that we want answered ourselves mm-hmm. as, as writers that we're putting on the page. Right. And, um, and whatever that that answer, whatever the answer is that that the reader gets from from reading those words, uh, it's it's such a powerful exchange mm-hmm. to have with a reader. So 100%. yeah, that yeah keeps me going. <laughs> we leave, and I've told this to other people as as a writer. I feel like we leave a little piece of our soul in every book. Um, and uh, you know, certain characters have little bits of our opinion, maybe, or our message, or our thoughts, and there's normally and probably not one person or one thing that's all you, but there's little, little things. So again, back to what I was saying before, one day I'll leave this earth. Uh, there'll be part of me in these books. And if, if they still exist in some form, if people want to know who I was, I'm not just this little, you know, three or four line obituary or one or two line uh, tombstone. Man, if you grab one of my books, you'll know a little bit about me, or you know a little bit about the message I wanted to, li- you know, leave. And uh, unless you look at the real dark killer parts of it, then th- that's definitely not me. You know, <laughs> if it's that. that's definitely that's someone else I'm telling a story about. But no, I mean, but it's and that's I think that's the power of of what we get to do. So, and and I want to end with more of a serious question, but it's how I've ended all the interviews so far. <laughs> I might at some point get away from this, but I, I'm, I'm fascinated by the answers, um, which is kind of what we've just been talking about is, um, you know, life really is like a book. You're going to have a first page. You're going to have a last page. None of us, no matter what we might think or know, is none of us know how many pages we have. Um, the cool thing is as writers, we do get to write and we get to express ourselves. Well, you get to write your last page of your book. What would you want that? It's, 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 it, it can be heavy. It can be light, depending on how you want to look at it. But what would you want that last page to say? <laughs> Take as much time as you need. Um, my husband said that whenever I die, uh, the thing that would be on, on my, my, uh, my tombstone, my headstone, would be um, make it happen. Um, it's something that I say a lot uh, to my kids um, <laughs> to if we're hurrying out the door, make it happen. Come on, make it happen. <laughs> and I I have to tell myself that too all the time whenever I'm writing. So yeah, I would say uh, that that would probably be the thing. Make make it happen. Whatever it is, whatever it is in your life that you want to do, um, just make it happen. I love it. I love it. it. it can. I think we talk ourselves out of so many things we can accomplish because we find the negative or we find all the ways it's going to fail. And we're probably right. It's going to, we're going to fail so many times, but man, the power of getting back up, no matter whether it's writing or writing or doing a song or whatever it is, just starting a new business, whatever it might be. Um, we're so much more than what we think we are. And if we can just embrace that more often, you're never, never always going to think that, but if we can embrace that more often, and I think just as people, you know, we're so, yeah. just talk about the communities and everything. We're so damn divided as a country and as people, we can be so divided, but I don't, I don't think we are. That's where I think the magic is, is I think we're told we are. And I think we're told we're divided because there's more power in that. And you can control people yeah. if you think they're all against each other. And I think we have so many diverse values, but we have some core values that the majority of people agree. Okay, focus on those. Focus on those is our first step to getting closer versus, man, you like Trump or you like Biden or you like this person, you like that person. Yeah. And yes, it's important. But man, if we put all of our energy into, well, how dare that person want to vote for that person? Or how dare that person be against this? It's like, where's our common ground? Find the common ground and then build off it. It's maybe it won't work, 
But what if it does? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I agree. Well, thank you, Heather, for coming on. I will not call you Amy. Thank you, Heather, for coming on. <laughs> I'll probably see you one day. And I'll be like, Amy, what's up? And you'll be like, if you do, please, you have my permission. Just either slap or a good cold cock. It's okay. I'll take, I'll be like, oh, that's right. I deserve that because I got a name wrong. The right hook. The right hook. I'd be afraid of the right hook. I don't know. I, I, <laughs> moms normally can well up a punch because, you know, especially you got, to, you probably carried your kids maybe in your right arm or whatever. You, it, yeah, it's always the the right arm's got like all all, all of the muscle. Exactly, that, this is my gun right here. <laughs> I don't want to take. I, I'll I'll put Sean in front of me or something. He's a big guy. He, he can you know. Let, <laughs> I'll make sure I'm standing next to Sean. No, I'm kidding. Um, yeah, it was great. It was great. I appreciate you having me on. Thank you for coming on. It was gr great to meet you. I hope I'll meet you. I again, I think I saw you from a distance years ago, but we'll have to connect at some point. Um, yes, for sure. People that want to find out more about you or go buy your books, what's the what's the best little <laughs> place for us to send them? Yeah, you can go to my website, heatherlevywriter.com. You can follow me uh, and keep up with me. I'm mostly on Instagram, mostly posting on Instagram at uh, Heather L. Levy. Um, same thing on X, although I'm really kind of just posting updates on there because <laughs> so, it's sad now. I know. <laughs> Um, but yeah, uh, if you want to keep up though on um, most things, it's uh, just check out my website and, and yeah, plug, uh, hurt for me is out now. This Absolutely. violent heart out next, uh, February. So there we go. Everyone go support Heather. Thank you for coming on. <laughs>